With me today, Senator Julian Sear. Lots happening uh, at the State House, Julian. Uh, you are in a, an extension from July 31st, which is normally when the legislature uh, breaks for the year. Uh, tell us, what have you been working on? There's so many different things there, but let's first talk about the extension uh, to the deadlines. Sure, and Paula, good, good to be with you, I'll, I'll be it remotely. Uh, looking forward to when we can get in and use that brand spanking new studio at Barnesville Town Hall. Probably won't be till 2021, uh, unless you know, we're lucky. Uh, but um, so we've been very busy in the legislature, really trying to meet the moment, um, you know, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it's just clear we have, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do uh, in, in, in arguably the greatest health crisis the state and the country have faced in 100 years. Uh, so traditionally, um, the legislature uh, sort of ends what are called formal sessions, which are basically the, when we meet and take on big, weighty issues and then pass them into law. Um, we typically end those on election years, on, on even numbered years, on July 31st. And we've done that for, for nearly two decades. Um, really is sort of a, a, a good governance practice, actually, right, to sort of remove legislating from um, the electoral process. Uh, but with COVID-19, there just continues to be a whole host of uncertainty, particularly around the budget. So the budget is sort of the biggest thing we do every year. Massachusetts has a $43 billion budget uh, and just a lot of uncertainty. So right now we estimate that um, there's about, uh, we estimate there's gonna be about a $6 billion shortfall in revenue for FY21, uh, which is the fiscal year that we're currently in now that started July uh, 1st. And we, um, we know that we're not gonna have a lot of revenue. What we don't yet know is what kind of support we're gonna have from the federal government. Uh, and, and currently this is being sort of hashed out actually as we speak in Washington. Um, if we were to, if, if we're what the House of Representatives is proposing um, were sustained, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would get about $10 billion from the federal government. Um, that would cover us for this fiscal year and probably for, for the next fiscal year. Uh, it, it would really mean that um, we'd be in, 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 in pretty strong shape um, if what the U.S. Senate passed, which is closer to like 2.5 or maybe $3 billion in resources, we'd still have a gap. We'd have to dip into our rainy day fund. Um, we are not only just concerned about this fiscal year, FY21, but I'm more, even more concerned about fiscal year 22. So that's a fiscal year that's going to start uh, July 1st, uh, 2021. Um, and, and that's where we'll really see, I think, you know, the, 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 the sustained economic impacts, the recession that, that we're in because of this pandemic. Um, so because, in, it, mostly because of the budget, um, but also because there's a number of really important kind of issues that are still out there, working to be negotiated, whether it's healthcare, transportation, um, some work on police reform that's been really crucial, uh, and it, climate change, um, which both chambers have passed legislation. Uh, we're extending our session. Uh, and so we'll be meeting, um, you know, through the fall, um, primarily to get a budget done. Um, and hopefully by September or early October, we will have sort of the full picture um, as far as what kind of support we're gonna get from the federal government. We'll have more information about what the revenue picture looks like, um, you know, what revenue is coming into the state, and then we can make an informed decision. Um, this is sort of the, the hardest of fiscal times for us. Uh, just for, for viewers, for context, the revenue shortfall that we saw during the Great Recession years um, was about uh, was was about a three billion two point five three billion dollar revenue shortfall. The shortfall where we're looking at now is double that, right? So we're talking about essentially double the pain, double the revenue loss um, of what we saw during those Great Recession years. So certainly uh, a steep challenge for the state. Um, I will say that we have already made a commitment when it comes to local aid and when it comes to Chapter seventy funding. This is the funding that goes to, to public schools. Um, we are going to be funding local aid for this current fiscal year um, at maintenance, so the same level as it was funded last fiscal year, and we're going to be funding Chapter 70, that school aid, uh, at maintenance plus inflation, meaning that um, both uh, local aid and schools, uh, we're really trying, and I think we're going to um, succeed in holding them harmless, at least for this fiscal year. Uh, that's a big, big, big accomplishment, something I, I didn't expect we'd be able to do. Um, so that is that is good news uh, for the town of Barnstable, and it's good news for uh, all 20 towns that I represent. Right. 
And, and, and budget notwithstanding, because I know you do have some additional time, there's been quite a few uh, flurry of bills that always happen at the, this end of the session. Sure do. Um, and let's start with maybe some backup here. Let's start with the transportation bill. Um, this is uh, one of the, the big pieces uh, of um, what we here on Cape Cod rely on as uh, reliable transportation, the CCRT, as well as the bridges. What was in that bill that w would affect Cape Cod and Barnstable? So a lot of really good things. Uh, there's $350 million for uh, all of the work that needs to go into replacing um, the Bourne and the Sagamore bridges, uh, something that we here on Cape Cod have, have long awaited for. Um, with now approval from the federal government, uh, it looks like those projects could begin um, as soon as the middle of this decade, which is a faster timeline than I even expected. Uh, so 350 million though, for all the work that needs to go into, um, you know, redoing those bridges, building new bridges. Uh, my brand new colleague, uh, Sue Moran, who represents the Upper Cape, uh, who is just fantastic. She's hit the ground running. She secured that. That's a big, big amendment to secure. Um, and then I was able to get uh, $7.5 million in resources for um, our park and ride infrastructure. So I hear a lot from constituents specifically about the exit six park and ride. Um, I experienced this myself. I haven't been, uh, I'm certainly not carpooling these days, but pre COVID, you know, I'd meet my district director, Jeff Soares, who lives in Osterville. We'd, we'd meet at uh, exit, exit six. I'd be driving down from Truro. Um, and very often than not, we would find uh, there's no parking at exit six and we'd have to drive to Sagamore and park and carpool from there. Uh, so what the amendment that I secured in this transportation bill um, earmarks dollars both uh, to expand and to look at the exit six park and ride and also to create a new park and ride and sandwich on at exit two. Um, so the hope is that uh, these investments paired with what we do uh, with the Sagamore and the Bourne Bridges um, that we're going to be seeing some sort of big changes for transportation uh, in, um, in, in about the middle of this decade, which uh, certainly they can't come soon enough, but, um, you know, Cape Cutters have been patient and uh, should really make a big difference, particularly for those of us who, um, you know, making that trek up to Boston, uh, whether for, for pleasure or for work. And it seems like we're going to have more people now in part because of COVID-19, people have been able to work remotely. I think we're actually going to have more people who are going to be able to, you know, live on Cape full time, maybe a commute up to the city one day a week or one day a month. Uh, and, and so those park and ride options, I think, will be really critical for us. Right. And, the, you know, we talk about equity, um, you know, uh, obviously transportation and, and getting people different types of uh, work here on the Cape that obviously Boston uh, offers a little bit more. They can work remotely. We've all learned to do that uh, in the last <laughs> few months. But there was also um, health care. There was a really big uh, opportunity for the legislature to do something with step therapy. Can you talk about this health care bill that went through? Because I don't think people really understand how important it really was. Sure. So, so, so I've prioritized health care in, in my career prior to joining the Senate. I work for the Department of Public Health, as some of your viewers may know. Um, so I really care about health care. I think health care really matters. Um, and, and we've done a lot of things on health care. Uh, in June, we passed uh, a bill to expand telehealth. Um, viewers may recall that last in February, we passed the Mental Health ABC Act, which I led, uh, which really to provide parity and, and really transform mental health in Massachusetts. Um, but what we just did uh, at the end of July um, was to pass legislation on so-called step therapy. So step therapy um, is a protocol, is a process that insurers require um, patients to go through um, when they're moving through a drug, right? So uh, it's not the doctor, your doctor, who's determining your course of treatment. It's the insurance company that's um, determining the course of treatment. And it's really based on, on cost savings. So they're wanting you to try, um, you know, a cheaper drug, say, for, for treating your rheumatoid arthritis or for your cancer. Um, and if you sort of fail, if that drug fails, you fail to improve on that. Um, then you can sort of, you know, move on to the next step of a drug. Well, when you actually look at the data here, um, these so-called step therapy policies actually result in um, a lot more pain uh, and suffering for patients. And they ultimately actually, I believe, really contribute to healthcare costs. Um, you know, they're sort of penny wise and pound foolish. You're saving a little bit of money um, at the front end, but you're uh, realizing, uh, you know, increased hospitalizations, readmittance, um, other things that actually add cost to the system. So what the Senate did is, is we took up legislation to reform step therapy. 
Um, you know, we don't ban it outright, which I'd, I'd like to do, um, but we take a pretty common sense approach to say, hey, look, you know, um, there needs to be a common set of rules around step therapy. Patients need, uh, patients and their doctors need a, a common sense appeals process. Uh, and so that's what we did. We passed it uh, unanimously in the Senate. Um, and it's now pending before a ha the House and just, you know, one more piece on healthcare that'll make a difference. The larger healthcare bill that I referenced earlier, that is now in what's called a conference committee. So it's being negotiated uh, between the House and the Senate. I actually am one of the three senators who's appointed to that committee. Um, so, so we're going to hash that out in the weeks and the months ahead. And hopefully, you know, before the end of the year, we'll send a, a bill to the governor's desk um, that does a lot around telehealth and teletherapy, uh, does a lot around mental health um, and, and a number of other really crucial issues uh, in supporting, uh, you know, our healthcare system, which is, um, you know, always been essential, but, but now more so during COVID-19. And when we, we, we talk about transportation or healthcare, you know, uh, the, the dollar sign in the room is usually economic development because it all has to be paid for somehow. <laughs> so talk about the economic development um, bill that has just come out that really at this point, you know, we're all reeling, um, you know, our businesses, our small businesses, um, our restaurants, everybody that has been, is affected by COVID-19. What does this economic bill do that was really, already planned, but then shores up some of these really uh, huge challenges that businesses are facing. So, you know, we, we had an economic development bill sort of in the works before the pandemic hit, uh, but we went back and we rewrote it completely um, to focus on the pandemic. And there's a lot of good stuff in there, especially for Cape Cod, $20 million uh, in relief for restaurants, $20 million for our, our, our cultural sector. Um, which often doesn't get a lot of help. Ten million dollars around additional dollars uh, in tourism promotion. Um, so all these things are, are sort of really important, good pieces. The other big piece that that we um, got at in this bill was around housing. And when you talk about economic development on Cape Cod, um, the number one issue here is housing. When I talk to uh, business owners um, about the challenges that they're seeing. Uh, it's housing, it, it's getting attainable housing for uh, their workers. Uh, when I talk to young families on the Cape, the number one issue closely followed up, the second, number, the second issue is childcare, but the first issue is housing. Uh, and so we um, passed a number of important housing provisions in here, including um, this housing choice proposal, uh, which really just sort of lowers some of the thresholds around decisions around affordable housing that happen at the town level. I was able to, um, I filed a few amendments and was able to secure an amendment that creates uh, a local option property tax exemption for people who are renting, currently renting, providing rentals um, at affordable rates for year-round people. Um, so something that we've seen a real trend, uh, certainly in Barnstable, we've seen it in my neck of the woods in the Outer Cape uh, of this, this condoization of what used to be year-round rentals now being flipped and turned into either condos or being turned into short-term rentals. We want to incentivize landlords to keep on renting to year-round folks. And so this property tax exemption, um, it's done town by town, so the town has to, to agree to it. But it's basically a way for the town to incentivize uh, people who own property um, to continue to be landlords and to, to rent at affordable rates, right? Not just getting the... Um, you know, certainly the market, particularly for short-term rentals, is, is, is very, uh, very hot and demands a high price. But to do something to kind of further keep the people who are renting. Uh, and then we also established a task force in this economic development bill to really sink our teeth into housing policy here on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Um, you know, this is, uh, aside from, from climate change and, and, and climate disruption, which is a little bit more of a, an existential threat for us, I really see housing as our biggest challenge, and uh, I'm glad that we, we addressed that in this bill. And, and when we talk about those housing challenges, um, you know, obviously in the last few months uh, between mortgages and um, those types of uh, rents being due, those pieces there, the pandemic really has brought forth some of the disparity in our communities that we really do have to address. And I think this yeah. economic bill actually addressed some of those disparities. Yes, I mean, you know, it's a start. You know, look, COVID-19 is just exposed. Um, what we knew, you know, I think some of us certainly knew were vulnerabilities and, 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 and were gaps, and, and they've really become, in COVID, exposed as real gaping fissures. And, and the, 
uh, inequities that we see now are, are, are huge problems, whether it's on, um, you know, whether it's childcare, whether it's the achievement of students in schools, and we're looking about return, you know, we're, we're, we're going into the new school year, um, and, and a bunch of this is going to be remote. Well, you know, the most, um, the most left out kids, the kids who don't have families with a lot of resources are the ones that are going to struggle the most, um, you know, to participate in a remote learning environment. When we actually look at who COVID-19 is affected here in Barnesville County, um, you know, if you look at the rate of COVID-19 among white people, uh, so, so, so we, we look at the numbers of cases per 10,000. Um, so it's about 33, 34 cases per 10,000 for white individuals. Uh, and it's uh, 96 cases uh, per 10,000 for, for those who are black. These are the kind of health disparities and equity disparities that COVID-19 has really laid bare. And from a policy position, we've really got an obligation to, um, you know, fix them. Yes, from a justice perspective, but also from, a, you know, a, a recovery and an economic vitality perspective. Right. And, and let's talk a little bit about um, the reopening. Obviously, uh, we, we, we know we're supposed to have a muted summer, but the traffic doesn't always seem that way. Yeah. <laughs> the, traffic is, <laughs> the traffic has not been muted. Uh. <laughs> so you're, you're heading up the reopening task force. Um, Governor Baker has done multiple phases with multiple steps. We seem to be heading a little higher as we come into the summer. We've had some real challenges with um, mask wearing and large groups gathering together, obviously in Chatham and Falmouth, which have been the most publicized. Um, where do you see us now? What did we do right? And what do we need to continue to do to keep this pandemic at bay here on Cape Cod? So I think we did a lot of things right, particularly after we came out of that surge, uh, you know, in, in April and early May, um, and really did a good job of keeping case counts low here on Cape Cod and, and across the region on the islands as well, um, really till until we got about to, to, to the 4th of July. Uh, and sort of prior to that, um, we were seeing sort of a, a sort of declining trend in cases. Um, and now that we're now over four weeks from July 4th, uh, really, since then, we've seen a, a, an increase in cases. I want to be clear, um, it's not a spike in cases, uh, but sort of the, the, the average number of cases have moved from averaging about four cases a day on average to, you know, about 12 cases a day on average, 10 or 12 cases a day on average. Um, that's significant. Uh, what we're not seeing is we're not seeing a clear co like correlation between uh, folks participating in some sort of uh, activity that's been allowed to reopen. Say we're not seeing cases pop up from people who, you know, went on a certain excursion or, 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 or did indoor dining or participated in this or that. What we tend to be seeing is where and where we see the, the bulk of the increase in cases come from these private events um, where, you know, young folks, and, and I'm, I'm not young, but I'm not, I'm not that old, right? I, so I can sort of appreciate the desire to to, to socialize and connect with folks and, and, and have some, you know, have just some, some human connection. Um, but these house parties, particularly the house parties that are occurring indoors, um, have really been efficient places where, where COVID-19 has been able to spread. We've seen this in Chatham, we saw this in Falmouth, I, I'm afraid we're gonna see it elsewhere too. Um, and you know, the message really here is, we know a lot more about COVID-19 than we did at the outset of this. We know that it's a lot harder to transmit COVID-19 when you're in small groups versus large groups. It's a lot harder to transmit COVID-19 outdoors versus indoors. So my advice for folks is keep it small and take it outdoors. We have ample uh, breezes and sunlight here on Cape Cod. We know it's a lot harder to transmit COVID-19 um, outdoors versus indoors. Take it outside, keep groups small. Um, and this is really what's gonna determine um, where we go next. And I will note, for, particularly for, for the younger folks, most of these are, you know, high school students or college students, you know, we are looking at the start of the school year. What we do with the school year is going to be, is de probably going to be determined by, by, by your behavior. And if you take personal responsibility, if you keep it small, if you take it outdoors, we'll hopefully keep our cases low. If we see the opposite of that, um, it's likely to see more delays in school openings, um, and likely could mean a very cold, hard, long winter um, with you stuck at home with whoever your parents are, um, not going back to college, not maybe going into high school. Um, that's certainly something I wouldn't have wanted uh, when, when I was that age. Um, I still don't want it. And, uh, 
you know, I, I think that um, we're really just asking folks to follow the protocols. We know what we need to do to keep everyone safe. Cover your nose and mouth when you can't be apart from others. Wash your hands and wash services frequently. Stay apart from others. Um, and if you, you know, be vigilant for symptoms. If you're feeling ill, stay home. Right. And I guess I want to end with this, this last one. Um, it was uh, something that a lot of folks don't really understand how the Steamship Authority is funded. Um, we saw this, uh, uh, you know, a couple of articles in the newspaper uh, that they were running low on funds. Tell us a little bit about how the steamship, because we're a port uh, city for the you steamship are. right here in uh, Barnstable and Hyannis. Um, we, how, how does that all work? They're a federal entity and the state stepped in or they're a no, state they're, entity yeah. and the federal stepped in? So no, <laughs> It's very neither, confusing. Um, so they're a state and they're, they're, they're an independent state agency and, and the state stepped in. Um, so the Steamship Authority was established uh, in the 1960s as the lifeline to the islands. And the Steamship Authority is very unique. It's only one of two transit authorities in the country um, that is self-sustaining, meaning it doesn't receive dollars from taxpayers and it sustains itself from the fare box. So the fare you pay on that ticket to go to Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard um, is what keeps the Steamship Authority running. Um, they've got some other issues going on, but from a fiscal perspective, they've always been in strong shape you know, since they were established in the 1960s. Well, when COVID-19 hit, particularly in mid-March, in April, in May, their ridership plummeted. And that meant their, their revenue also took a nosedive. Um, and the way that the, the, the authorizing statute, the law for the Steamship Authority is structured is that if the authority runs a deficit at the end of the year, and if the Commonwealth of Massachusetts essentially has to borrow resources uh, to bail the Steamship Authority out from that deficit, then the port communities are on the hook to pay the bill. And so that means that, uh, you know, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, the Martha's Vineyard towns, but also Barnstable, Falmouth, New Bedford, um, had a poten potential for a pretty significant financial liability. Um, you know, last I checked, the Steamship Authority uh, was on course to run a potentially $22 million deficit at the end of this year. Um, that would have meant, you know, the town of Barnesville having to come up with, you know, about three, maybe $4 million uh, to foot that bill in the middle of a really tough fiscal situation. Um, so what I did is I fought in the Senate in a supplemental budget that we took up uh, to essentially make sure that if the Steamship Authority runs a deficit at the end of this year, that the Commonwealth is going to foot the bill, that, that the state is going to pay to make the Steamship Authority whole, and we're going to hold harmless our port communities, including Barnstable. This was a big, 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 big deal. I was proud to get it done in the Senate. Um, my friend and colleague, Dylan Fernandez, did terrific work to get this done in the House, um, and, and it was sent to the governor, it was signed into law. Um, so, so this means big things. Uh, you know, again, you know, of no fault of their own of the Steamship Authority, um, you know, a well-run institution, particularly fiscally, but with those plummeting, you know, fare box and, and, and that revenue there, they needed some help. And um, we, we, we brought home the bacon, if, if, you know, as, as they say, uh, to make sure that they kept them whole and most importantly, to keep poor communities like Barnesable from putting the bill. And just to wrap it up, Julian, you've, you've got a few more things I know that are, uh, are out there pending. Um, you know, what can residents kind of look forward to the end of the legislative session? Sure. So, you know, we've got, we've got five months left in the session now because we're, we're going to the end of the year. Um, I mentioned the health care reform conference committee that's out there. Uh, the Senate uh, last winter passed a pretty comprehensive sweeping uh, climate change bill to get Massachusetts net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The House just passed uh, a similar companion bill. That's in conference committee. Um, and then we have this police reform uh, bill and, and racial justice bill that's in conference committee. Uh, the Senate passed a, a pretty broad police reform and racial justice bill in mid-July. Um, you know, the House followed suit uh, a week or two later. And we're really trying to meet the moment uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that, that and a lot of change that's needed. Um, yes, in law enforcement, but if we're just focusing on law enforcement, we're missing the bigger picture. Um, we see structural racism and inequity in all of our institutions, um, you know, whether it be our schools, our financial institutions, housing. Um, so we're starting on law enforcement. Uh, that was certainly a big kind of controversial piece of legislation. That's still in conference committee. Actually, my colleague, Tim Whalen, um, who represents, uh, you know, the, the, the northeast side of Barnstable, um, he's on that conference committee, uh, and, and so that's yet to be resolved as well. So, so stay tuned. 
Uh, lots more news coming out of Beacon Hill. We're trying to work really hard to meet the moment. The Cape Cod Reopening Task Force, you know, which I'm a proud member of, um, will be continuing to meet. We're, we're training our gays on uh, schools and school reopening. Child care has emerged is a, a huge, huge, big challenge. Um, <laughs> there's a lot on our plate. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be able to duck out and take a, a few days at the beach in August, but otherwise uh, it, it's full steam ahead. I mean, this is the, we're in sort of the biggest crisis our nation has seen arguably in a century. And um, we're just gonna do everything we can uh, to keep Cape Codders uh, safe and, 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 and to recover and to come out of this stronger than before. Excellent, good work, Julian. Uh, we'll look forward to your next update because I'm sure there'll be another one uh, shortly with uh, all the work that's still to be done. Good to be with you, Paula, thank you. Thank you.